All right. Hello, everybody. All right. I think it sounds like it's, it's, I mean, if you think about it, like the, the May, um, let's see, I'm just reading something. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. All right. I think we're ready. I think we're ready to do the thing. Turn on our backup recording. Recording Sarah, in progress. This meeting is being recorded. Ooh, echo. Anyway, hi everybody. Lots of this is this is amazing. It's so great that you're all here with us. Thank you so much. Welcome to Brain Club. For those who I don't know yet, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she they pronouns, and I am executive director here at All Brains Belong. So let me share screen, and I will orient us to our conversation. Okay. Woo. Um, I, uh, so, so as we continue our conversation on neurodivergent lived experiences, today we'll be talking about um, some specific themes um, that many autistic people experience. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give some disclaimers in a minute. But first, by way of, because I, I know this is, uh, uh, many of you are new to Brain Club, just by way of our community agreement, um, all forms of participation are okay here. You can have your video on or off, and even if it's on, we do not expect anything of you. We certainly don't need you to look at the camera. You know, you can walk, move around, stim, fidget, eat, you know, all the things. Anyway, and everyone is welcome here, um, people of all ages. Um, all communication is okay, so you can, unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat box. You can, you know, any anything you're most comfortable with. And um, safety comes first at all of our All Brains Belong programs. Come on, Sarah, are you are you able to see the, the waiting room you still, so I don't have to, I, I can, yes. okay, yeah, you're on I'm it. Hitting, all right, sweet. I'm hitting admit all. Thank you, perfect, thank you. Anyway, um, I have the kind of brain that when the thing pops up, I'm like, oh, shiny object, got it, anyway. Um, so um, safety comes first for all of our programs. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, it's really important that we're respecting and protecting one another's access needs, anything that we need for full and meaningful participation. Um, and so especially um, when um, you know, access needs may in fact conflict. For example, um, I have the kind of brain that often monologues and, you know, has 15 minute sentences. Um, and um, another participant may have the kind of brain that benefits from short things to listen to. So navigate it, navigating that. So we really want to try to give space for everyone to participate here. And um, given the size as our Brain Club crew has been growing, um, you know, my, my access needs as a facilitator are to make sure that everyone has the environment that they need to participate. So I may, um, I may move us along um, when we've spent, you know, when, when we've had it, you know, a, a lot of detail on a particular topic. Um, and just try to try, try to give space for everyone to participate. And by the way, observation is a completely valid form of participation. And if you would like to be directly um, interacting, we wanna make sure that there's space for you to do that. And um, uh, my, my access needs as a dyslexic facilitator um, are that um, when, if, if there's a lot of activity in the chat, you may find that I'm so, like reading out selections from the chat. Um, but please feel free to use the chat um, for, for, for ongoing dialogue between participants. So um, lastly, today is for education purposes only. It's not medical advice and individual traumatic experiences are best processed in a therapeutic setting. Last bit of access, um, closed captioning are uh, it's, it's enabled. You just uh, need to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, either the live transcript closed captioning icon 
Or if you don't see that, try more dot, dot, dot and choose show subtitles. And you can choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And then lastly, um, the chat box, um, if you're new to Zoom, um, at least on your computer, you're looking for that picture of the speech bubble to access the chat box. And there's often lots, lots of dialogue in the chat box. Um, if you're on your phone, it, I think it looks something like that, but it might be in slightly different order. Okay, we're ready. So we're continuing. So this, this month's theme neurodivergent lived experiences was requested by you. Um, Brain Club regulars requested this theme. And I think it's, I, I, uh, I, I'm really grateful for last week's dialogue on neurodivergent burnout and like it or not, um, neurodivergent burnout is, is part of autistic life experience. And so we're, I think, I think, I think that will be a theme that we'll, we'll still be revisiting today. So, you know, um, we're all different people. Um, and when we talk about autistic life experiences, there is not one autistic life experience. And so um, I thought about how, you know, um, and, 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 you know, I think, I think a really powerful brain club, probably my, one of my favorite ever brain clubs was the first week of April when we had our, pa our panel of late identified neurodivergent adults. Um, I thought about doing another panel and then I thought, well, I, I, how, how are we going to look at the, you know, big picture of autistic life experiences. And so I thought that how we would anchor this conversation is by looking at um, um, uh, not, not just a handful of folks, um, but um, you know, 7,500 people um, to look at some trends. Um, and this comes from the Autistic Not Weird survey, which is an annual survey um, conducted by an autistic educator. Um, and uh, we'll go through, we'll go through some highlights. Is Lizzie here yet to pop links in the chat? Sweet. Okay. So Lizzie, if you can, if you can pop the autistic network, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I wanted to begin with this. Misunderstandings. So, um, quote, the general public doesn't understand enough about autism. So amongst autistic respondents, um, almost everyone agreed um, and, and, and almost 80% strongly agreed with that. And when we think about, and we talk about this a lot at Brain Club, the double empathy problem. This is a term coined by autistic social scientist, Dr. Damian Milton, that says that it's not that there is you know, one normal set of social skills. And you know, if you don't have those, you know, you're not normal. It's, it's repeatedly in research findings. What's been shown is that it's the mismatch of worldview, the mismatch of communication style that results in miscommunication, misunderstanding. Um, autistic to autistic communication um, is uh, often quite efficient, quite effective. Um, and it's the bi-directional, um, non-autistic people have a really hard time um, uh, uh, taking perspective of autistic people. And so that's that this, this survey supports that. Early experiences. I'm just catching up in the chat. Um, a couple of folks sharing that um, that um, uh, at this website you can access a whole range of resources that are um, really really awesome. Early experiences. I knew I was different from an early age. Sixty point seven percent strongly agree. 27% agree, so almost everybody. Um, and that that reminds me so much of what our panelists shared um, in April. Learning about my autism 
has had a powerful impact on me overall. So you can see the trends there. And that's, you know, that's, 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 uh, that's why we have brain club, right? Like this is this, the power of, you know, uh, coming to understand oneself, becoming more familiar with different aspects of one's experience, hearing the experiences of other people, many of whom have, um, you know, similarities to one's own experience, um, many times are, are different, like that, that, that's what this is all about. Um, you know, self-awareness, self-knowledge. So speaking of education, how about educational experiences growing up? My experience at school was positive. And this is of, of all autistic responses. Um, uh, you can see a large trend toward disagree and strongly disagree. And amongst autistic children, that pattern is, is, is there. I want to share from, you know, uh, um, a couple of things that I think are, are, are important to, um, to note. And Kelly's just saying um, that uh, Kelly used this graph when trying to advocate at our old school district. That's really powerful, Kelly. That, thanks for sharing that. So what we know is that in Vermont, 587 at least children are secluded and or restrained in Vermont schools. And what we know is that these practices are disproportionately used against children with disabilities and children of color. And um, Lizzie's just linked in the chat to um, uh, a, a, a website post on our on our site um, lives in the balance dr ross green um, uh, recently released a documentary on restraint and seclusion in vermont schools um, dr green came down and interviewed um, families educators healthcare providers in the abb village and um, uh, so this this is all abb village members in this documentary so I, um, I invite you it's it's hard it's a, but a content content warning because um, it's talking about really terrible stuff um, and this is part of autistic children's experience in Vermont schools and we advocate strongly against this here's a poem from a child in our village. I'm gonna read some, um, some lines. When I am here, I feel like a caged bird. School my captor. Too scared to speak, I stay silent like a mouse. I do my best and still get punished. My brain and my heart are sore. We are all worthy of our own autonomy. I'm gonna pause there. What do you think of this? Free to use the chat. Feel free to unmute. How's this landing with folks? Ellie says that's gut wrenching. I hate it for us all. Yeah, me too. Jake said, um, I thought a 50 year old adult wrote it. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, so powerful, so painful. Yeah. And when one gets out of school, the challenges don't stop. So we know that there's research that autistic people are four to eight times more likely to be unemployed compared to non-autistic people. And we see that um, you know, there's, there's certainly a distribution, many, many people struggling, struggling with finding employment and retaining employment. 
And um, we're going to be talking about neurodivergent challenges in the workplace next week at Brain Club. Steve says, in the 60s, we were too terrorized to think that way. You mean in terms of um, uh, reflections on school? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've been posting quite a bit about, um, about employment and neurodivergent burnout on our, on our Instagram page. And so if you, um, if, 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 if you don't already follow us on Instagram, um, you can check out these posts and we're going to be covering this content at Brain Club next week, as I said. Lizzie, can you dump some links in the chat? You know, we we think, especially when we think about how many unrecognized neurodivergent people are out in the world, and um, uh, neuro inclusive employment, creating workplaces for people with all types of brains to thrive, benefits everyone. Um, and you know, that's that's many workplaces are designed for one type of brain. And um, I don't, I, I, I would imagine that that's, that's not news to, um, to you all. Social experiences. The overwhelming majority of autistic people who participated in this survey so that they feel socially isolated. I feel the need to mask my personality in groups of non-autistic people. That's, you know, well over 90, 93, 94% of people. Um, I feel the need to mask my personality in groups of autistic people. Oh, hi, Jake. I didn't realize that was you. Hello. That's amazing. It's your brain club. Yay. Hi. fun to meet people on Instagram and then meet them in real life. In general, how accessible have you found the following? J.E. Got it. Thanks. Um, community groups not perceived as accessible. In your general experience, how accessible have you found the following? Schools, um, mostly somewhat inaccessible to largely inaccessible. Healthcare, somewhat inaccessible, largely inaccessible. That doesn't surprise me either. When we think about um, all of the many ways in which people are marginalized and othered. And we think about the, you know, the, 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 the intersectional experiences of trauma and oppression. When we think about the, you know, the, the, the large overlap, um, you know, the, the, the relationship between neurodiversity and diversity of gender and sexuality, um, there are a lot of, a, 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 so many different reasons that, that, that people are marginalized. And um, these these survey responses um, do do you know they they line right up with with um, a lot of the other research that's out there. And before I this is the last last slide and then we'll have lots of time for conversation. Um, I like being autistic, and for some people, um, they agreed with that. Many people, um, you know, I think for I, I, I think many people describe that um, having, um, you know, that that it's it's for them it's neither positive nor negative. It just is, and so um, I thought this was an interesting way to 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 close in that um, you know having 
how they just zooming out and describing trends and the themes um, is is can be a you know a, 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 a part of self awareness and self knowledge. So how's this landing? How does how does what you've seen compare to your own experiences? The numbers and stats are lining up a lot more than I would like. Yeah. I see some nods. Level when we find groups where we're the predominant population makes a lot of sense to me. Like how the graphs shift when it's a setting where there's no expectation that you not be autistic. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Keaton's, I think that's really important because I think, you know, when we talk about, you know, what goes into defining neuroinclusive space is that like normalizing that there's no right way to be a person and that, you know, there's no right way to show up. And, you know, most places that I'm in, those ground rules are not established. Kelly says, am I remembering correctly um, that um, there's a, an older chart that showed that that most people are embracing their autism now than in the past? Um, I, 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 I have not seen that in the autistic.weird survey. Um, and I think that, you know, there's, I, I, I think there's a lot to be hopeful for. I think that there's, you know, I think the community conversation around neurodiversity inclusion is 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 shifting and it's not shifting everywhere and there's still a lot of trauma and there's a lot of unlearning that has to be done from all the trauma that's been done before Um, Laura says, my almost four-year-old has started vocal stimming, I think, and I've been so appreciative that his school is very open to recognizing this as an important way of regulating for him. Autism hasn't even had to be part of the conversation. It's just recognizing as something that helps some kids, and that has felt promising to me. Christina says, it, um, the survey matches my experiences. It's funny. I'm glad that I'm autistic in some way, that it brings in the right people in my life. But when we have to navigate those areas where people don't get it, even if I explain it, clearly they still act negatively toward me, especially in accepting my direct communication style. Perhaps it's gender-based, but I would like to hear others speak on this. Yeah. Um, does that play out for others? JE's got a an infographic in the chat. You know, I, mean, I think it's a meme of mine. It's I said if a couple got their kids kidnapped by a corporate boss, I'm pretty sure the Supreme Court would tell you to be grateful they didn't kidnap the corporation. Well, it's 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 um you know I I I I think that there's so you know I I I one of the things that one of our panelists shared in April about like. Uh, one of one of the strengths of many autistic brains is to be able to zoom out and like recognize something that's not working. Anyway, your meme makes me think about that of just of of there's so much that's broken about society and that um, it, it's important for people to be able to call that out. Yeah. Hey, can I comment real quick? Yeah. Um, it's like, you know, oh, my last, my first, like my first neurodiversity kind of group project attempted nonprofit I got involved in, you know, at a certain point in time, one of my, you know, my person who my mentor at the time or friend who put it together, hiring his friends and keeping them happy became more important than like the neurodiversity mission. And it was like the second the 
either the organization became more important than the mission or the people became more important. It was like, wow, we're really useless at helping anyone now. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I think, I think it's really important to be, you know, focused on, on the mission, focused on the mission of changing the world and making it better for neurodivergent people. And I mean, Sears, I only say, I only Sears, say that because I only say that because, you know, in, in kind of on the flip side, a lot of us are pressed for time and resources. So, you know, it's, it takes a lot of work to like be in any kind of mental health recovery and push your life forward and like, you know, take care of your friends and like, it's complicated. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, um, part of being in, you know, an interdependent community, you know, being part of a community village where people support one another. I mean, without that, it's, it's, it's impossible. Ali says, I had a teenage client tell me today, quote, I hope I'm not autistic while discussing struggles at school. It absolutely broke my heart because she was so fearful of the label and so uninformed on the beauty of her brain and the wonderful community she so desperately craves. It really hit me how little people in her life, namely adults, have viewed her with such a narrow-minded lens and fixated on the norms of society that she doesn't align with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I... I was raised in a comparatively neurodiversity affirming household where like three quarters of my immediate family are neurodivergent. Um, and that wasn't known then, but was kind of like fine. Um, and this week in my life, it like, I'm autistic. My sibling is ADHD and my mom is pretty clearly autistic. And this week her dad had a conversation with her where he was like, you know, I've come to figure out that I'm autistic and, you know, I'm not his biggest fan, but like having my like 80 something year old grandfather be like, I have come to this conclusion in my life. Um, was very cool. But like, I grew up in a kind of like insulated bubble for the most part that was pretty accepting of the ways that I behaved as autistic. And I have these vivid memories of being like told terrible things in school that are kind of like comparative to what everyone's saying. And I think that like a lot, so for me, a lot of those things were said in private where teachers would know that what they were saying was wrong. Like, it doesn't matter if you know that the kid you're talking to is disabled in any way, but like, knew that what they were saying was ableist or was like was a negative way of behaving as a teacher and I think that sorry I'm rambling I think that a lot of the time administration start a podcast keep going I think that a lot of administrative officials and people like with a lot of authority in bureaucratic structures like schools and after school programs for children know that what they're doing is shaming and do it in private and that we wind up having these isolated traumatic experiences that we can't really work together about as children because we are absorbing the shame of that, of being spoken to alone as though it's so shameful, like whatever trait we've displayed is so shameful that it can't even be spoken about in front of other people. Yes. Yes to all that. Um, uh, like Linda's saying, the message is it's okay if you're different, just don't act different. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I I I I think that there's so many, um, you know, like the the, the I think if you have the kind of nervous system that is noticing everything and picking up on these like subtle yet profound messages that there's something broken and defective how can that not impact you
just scrolling up in the chat. Um, Laura says, um, can you imagine what could be possible if we recognized autistics on the experts of parenting autistic children? Shocking that it still seems so far away for so many people. Um, yeah, yeah. I just um, want to say that um, I, I think my, well, my nephew, I, I think is autistic and is undiagnosed and is in a pretty severe burnout and um, 28 has a child, you know, is like now living um, with my sister. And because of my experience with my sister has been such an advocate for me and a big supporter of me as I've unmasked and got clarity. And now that it's like, she's starting to recognize the signs where when I think his first autistic burnout really what major one was when he was 17 and it like the whole thing blew up and and so he's just needing to rest and I'm just saying sleep sleep if like he sleeps it's okay let him sleep and then her husband basically was like well trying to give the the idea of like if you just get out and do something you'll feel better if you just you know this whole mentality of and and it's so cool because I can see my sister advocating for her son saying that's not actually like, you know, he's a lot like Amy. You, you've watched Amy. You see Amy. He is like Amy. We need to look at it from that standpoint. And so it's been so cool as I've been out and been able to be vocal. And now that's starting in my family to trickle down where the shame is being is, you know, is less and um, and that people are starting to get their needs met and having conversations around access needs and how once we can start, I, I understand it's, it can be really challenging the pushback and I've certainly had that pushback, but I also think that if we can keep kind of coming together here, I get a lot of strength coming here and then and then being able to kind of teach my family and friends um, what's important and we can start trickling that down to other other people. I'm so proud of you. That is amazing. What an amazing story. And what a gift for your nephew. Mel, Kelly yeah, Cray uh, and the, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Sarah. I was gonna say Kelly Gray's hand is up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Kelly Gray and then Kelly Bordeaux. Go ahead. Hey, so you know, I really liked what Theodore said and I think we also need to understand how all encompassing this is. Psychology books, pamphlets, commercials, teacher education, scientific journals, medical books. Like it's really easy some days for me to get into a place where I'm really angry at people because I feel that way, because I feel that they're making this choice to talk in a disparaging way. But the more I go out there and have conversations with people, the more I realize how truly surprised they are that I even see it that way. Like it, They just think of it as the way they're supposed to talk about it. This is what the, their formal education, what those around them have always had, has been this deficit-based language. And we, because we've got this wonderful community sometimes kind of forget how far the world needs to get. And, um, and I think communities like this one and hopefully more, more communities like this in schools too are the way to kind of slowly break free of some of this. I have a lot to say about that. Um, and, and we'll come back to me because I'll remember. Uh, Tally, go ahead. I think um, they did such a great job marketing this as as the worst thing ever, right? Right from the get go, like never once has autism been viewed as something other than bad and wrong. And one day, this is old as finance, he's 14. So seven years ago, my husband took the kids to the park and he came home and he was just, he was just kind of, he was rattled and I could tell. And I was like, man, what happened? Did something go on? And he was like, Phineas was like noticing it at the park and he was just observing him. And finally Finn walked over to the kid's parent and asked the parent, is your kid autistic? And the parent got very offended 
and got very upset with Phineas and oh oh no why why no he no no and my husband was like so you know I I was listening and so I walk over and very quickly stopped the woman I was like you know hey he's asking because he's autistic and you know he just he likes to try to find people that understand him that's why he's asking and then the woman's demeanor changed oh oh I'm so sorry and my husband was like, there's literally nothing for you to be sorry about, ma'am, like other than your attitude. And then they just left the park. But like that just kind of stuck with me that like an adult would react to a child asking such a, a, a question about connection. Like I recognize it immediately. It's like, oh, wow, he was like totally trying to connect to this kid at the park. He must have seen something that just really you know, resonated with him. And to have that mom react like that was just the worst thing. How offensive to ask that about my child, you know? And it just, they did such a great job marketing it. And it's going to take so much work, like marketing it the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, I'm, 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 Curious, did you like did 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 Phineas perceive this whole situation, and did, did he like say anything? Like, did he wonder about it? Honestly, I'm not sure, Kristen. I don't think he really like checked in with him. You know, like I think he was just kind of like reeling with his own experience of it. And Finn really hasn't uh, mentioned it before or since. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, um, it, it's, it's, um, I, 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 I think that there are so many, just so much unlearning that has to be done. Um, when, um, uh, when Vermont public featured, um, you know, a conversation on autism last week, there was a caller who called in and, you know, I was asking this question about, you know, I mean, it was just, it was a very ableist question and it was just like, this is what people think. People think that, you know, that, that, that a lot of unlearning to do. Let me catch up in the, in the chat. Um, just a conversation around just like that. It's, it's a privilege to be safe and able to be out um, in, in, in a variety of settings. And there's just so 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 many people who don't don't have that privilege um because of all the judgment and all of the you know not just judgment but 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 often masking behavior is for survival literal survival i wonder um when we think back to, you know, so we, so, you know, we started off looking at this data from autistic, not weird. Um, what, what, what do you think are aspects of your autistic lived experience that, that you think are, are, are important to name or that are important to you to name? Um, uh, I don't really have a word, like a single word for it, but the fact that whenever something happened in school between me and another student, they never trusted my side of the story because I was autistic. So obviously I couldn't understand what was going on. And this continued into university. I was, I, I was often told, well, why do you expect people to do that? And you don't understand. Um, I'm curious, Liam, when did you reach the point when you recognized that that message was wrong and that this was a reflection on that person and not on you? Very recently, unfortunately. It took me until university to realize what was happening. Yeah, yeah. And that just it just became so normalized about, you know, oh, you don't know, you can't know, there's something about you that you don't know when it's really... It's a double empathy problem. They don't know. Mm -hmm. Lauren. Um, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> this just keeps coming up in my brain. I'm, um, this whole discussion. I grew, grew up in a household where I'm realizing that 
I'm pretty sure all five of us are autistic. My, maybe yeah. my mom is just ADHD, but the more I <laughs> know, the more I'm pretty sure she's autistic. But no one was diagnosed except my brother was diagnosed at 23, but he also had lots of learning disabilities, difficulty in school, like school was a, a nightmare for him, even, you know, regardless of the diagnosis, but <clears throat> autism in my family culture has, is so steeped in the deficit model that it is, has been really hard for me um, to have any kind of conversation about it with my family that comes from any other kind of perspective. And it's almost like his diagnosis became this like, oh, well, this is, this is why all of these things, this is what's wrong with him. You know, this is like all of that model, like I was so steeped in it and it's so part, it's so part of my family dynamics and interaction that it feels really hard to untangle. I've tried having some gentle conversations with my mom about neurodivergence and neurodiversity and looking at things from a, a, a different lens from that lens and not from a deficit lens. But like the closest she can get is like, oh, well, I told him like, look how well you're doing. You're a part of the 15% who can have a job. And I'm like, you don't know how horrible that sounds. Like you're completely unaware of how horrible that sounds. But like, it's so, it, I just, I'm sure other people have had this experience of it becoming so entrenched in family dynamics and family culture that it feels um honestly it start it becomes like family is not a safe place for me anymore and that's been a really difficult thing to come to terms with um thank you for sharing that lauren i think two two things that came up so one is like you know the 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 en enmeshment of like uh, and you know called denial or or, or whatever like it, it it's it's very hard to make someone have insight about their own selves, right? Like um, that. Um, and like a separate theme is that when when you are when you are self aware, when you've worked really hard to grow in your self awareness, and you are you know you've worked hard to show up as your true self and design a life that works for your brain, and then when you're in environments that invalidate that, it 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 becomes intolerable. It's very hard to go back. Yeah. yeah. Lauren. It bothered I can, me before. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say it bothered no, me no. before, but I could never put my finger on exactly what like made me feel, you know, bad about that way that it was talked about. But now I know exactly why it bothers me and I can't take it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Christina I, I and then the Sierra. Yeah, I have the same experience, Lauren. It's, it's, I understand cognitively and logically why my family can't get to the point where we can, where I could feel safe talking with them because it would require them each person reframing their whole existence and and accepting some really hard things about how they went through life and how they didn't get their needs met and how, there's just a lot of layers of stuff that like I feel like I've had the time to work through that they haven't had the time to work through and so I can't I understand I can't ask that of them so it, it is a little sad I've kind of had to grieve the loss of that kind of connection um but I'm trying to like make new ones like this group and stuff but it it is a little weird it's sort of like um sort of like like the death of something that I always thought was kind of like maybe in the realm of possibility but it's just it's a lot for them to deal with so they can't get there so it isn't yeah it is very similar yeah 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 it is a loss you know it's 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 grieving relationship or you know some some former narrative sierra i have to actually unmute um yeah i one thing i've been talking to a lot of people about recently is like there's the idea of like um skill regression with autism and I think especially for a lot of adults a lot of times it's really that you're just not willing to put up with stuff anymore so like oh I used to be able to work 
14 hour shifts every day and now I can't work more than eight hours in a day. Well, that's not skill regression. That's just me accepting that 14 hour shifts are a limit of mine and not something that's able to be done. And just that kind of process of like unmasking really does sometimes it is a grieving. It's losing, it's losing that masked self that you were. Um, and that can be losing relationship that can be losing person you thought you were. That can be, that can be a lot of different things. Yeah, it is. Sarah, thanks for naming that. I think two things come to mind for me. There is, you know, one, um, (laughs) 14 hour shifts are not healthy for most brains. So there's that, Um, but there's, you know, so much that then like the compounded upon internalized ableism of like, there's something wrong with me that I can't do this thing. And so it feels like a a regression as opposed to like, I know, I know my access needs now. Um, But, but it, it, there, there also is loss of skills associated with burnout. Um, So it may actually be that, you know, sometimes I can, sometimes I can read, you know, like I I was, I was reading, somebody sent me a really lovely article to read and I was like, oh, I, I guess I can read, um, processing that. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a cognitive load thing. And I think that's, that's real. Reading in the chat, Aaron shares, um, I've been engaging with my family a lot about autism, neurodivergence, and intergenerational trauma. It's helping me move through it to relate to the internalized ableism I expect many of my ancestors carried. That's really powerful, Aaron. You know, I think that um, I, I, it, it's also really amazing that you're engaging and dialoguing with your family. Um, I've, I've, I've not had that experience, um, but I can imagine it I imagine in perspective shift around like oh well that happens because I'm imagining what that must have been like you know for this family member um but um it's that's being able to you know when you have two two or more people who are self-aware and can you know figure out one another's access needs and figure out a way how to negotiate that's a completely different story than when one person's doing all the work Um, uh, Ali says, um, I've been stuck in this slump lately of feeling like I used to have it together much better, but really I was overwhelmed and I've just learned my limits now. Yeah. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of people say that when they, you know, they begin the unmasking process that, you know, they start quote acting more autistic and really, um, they are, they are unmasking. Um, and that's, it's, um, first off it, 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 requires so many extra spoons to mask. And so in the setting of burnout, you know, it may actually not not be possible. Um, And showing up as your true self, once you, if you're not cortically overriding your limbic system, you know, reacting to how unsafe so many environments are, that's the difference. Um, Kelly says, I had a quote learning center teacher quote tell me that when we flip our lids, we are regressing to childlike behavior and that the most important thing is to pull people out of it before it quote sticks. Ew, gross. This is literally what she was taught in school and only got her master's two years ago. Terrifying. Yeah, you know, I have a, you know, I have a limbic response when people use the word like tantrum, like they refer to themselves as having a tantrum. It's like, no, dude, you're dysregulated. Your access needs are being violated. That's what's happening. Amy. I had an um, idea that came up. Um, it's something that my therapist has been talking to me about, which is be, is talking about being the identified patient in a family system. And that, you know, that often we can be perceived as the problem or we use like sickness instead of access need. And so I think one of the things that Brain Club ha- helps me with is learning my access needs and communicating that instead of saying, sorry, I'm not feeling well, I won't. And um, my sister recently said, you know, I thought when you said you were sick, it meant you were, you were stressed or anxious. I didn't realize that you were actually like, you know, having mast cell activation or, or something. But I think the idea of being the identified patient in the family and kind of taking that back and saying, Hey, I'm actually not the only one who has access needs. Like, so at family functions, like I've requested, like doing, ha- having a puzzle out so that 
we don't, so if I can just be there by being in parallel play, and what I've noticed is that everyone's requesting the puzzle now. And so it's starting to like point out, like, see, I'm not the only one who is like bored and everyone's on their iPhones or has a hard time with like small talk or conversation. And so I just wanted to, I didn't know like if that was like, I had never really heard like the identified patient in a family system before. And so I just was thinking about that, like in the school system or, you know, like I was thinking about Liam's comment, like, oh, like he's the identified, you know, they're the identified patient. And so that therefore, like, we're just going to use that as the excuse instead of looking at what's happening in the, the culture or the system. Amen. And uh, Steve is sharing uh, the puzzle is universal design. Yeah. Sarah. What, what Amy was talking about, about the, about the identified uh, patient thing, um, just uh, uh, connected some dots for me about what we what we may be up against as a community. Um, there's actually in in the mental health movement at large, there's a um, there's a program in Finland called Open Dialogue, that's um, that's basically eliminated schizophrenia in that area of the country. Um, and one of the things that they did that they that they realized that they had to do was they couldn't separate patients. The reason it's called open dialogue is because they couldn't separate patients from their families. If they put the patient in the hospital, the person got labeled this identified patient and then the family moved on with their life and didn't have to do any work. And so, um, and so it, it's, it's like if we get put in that identified patient role rather than the family, rather than, rather than the family being, um, rather than, and, and not just the family, but our, our community actually, being um, having an obligation to try to communicate so that it works for all of us, um, we just get we just get siloed off, and and the normative culture goes on the way it, the way it the way it usually goes on, um, and and nothing changes. There's there's a lot of internal conflicting access needs and a lot of um, you know I, identity shifting. Um, and again, when you have multiple people who don't have self-awareness, that is really hard to bridge. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to just comment. There was a, a really important question in the chat that I just want to comment. Question was about, um, you know, what an access need is. Um, so just like, uh, th th that, that's, that's really referring to anything that anyone needs. Um, to fully and meaningfully participate. And everyone has access needs. Like Sarah says, everyone on the planet has access needs. It's just that when we think about neurodivergent people um, have, you know, being far more likely to have our access needs not met by the defaults of society. Um, there's a question on the chat about neurodiversity, inclusive or neurodiversity affirming um, uh, you know, recovery resources. If anybody has any um, thoughts on that, if you could share that either out loud or in the chat, that would be great. Um, Christina says, um, I like that concept, Sarah. I think that even in child and um, in, in schools, they label disabled kids as quote the identified patient. I think that 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 yeah, and that there is judgment associated that associated with that, um, as opposed to you know something. It is what it is. Um, I so so Aiden. I think the other thing that I'm gonna I'm gonna post in the chat, Lizzie. Can you post the Brain Club 2022? archives list the like the table of all the old brain clubs um because we 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 have um a ton of resources about access needs so an example of what that means so um i have you know if if i have an access need for um you know when i'm when i'm talking um i have i i have an access need for like a visual support of what I want to say, otherwise I meander and I go all over the place. Um, I have an access need for quiet in order to think most of the time. Um, when I'm, you know, when I'm reading, I need high contrast. Like these are all different examples, but you know, there, there's, there's emotional access needs, there's physical access needs, there's environmental access needs. Um, there's interpersonal access needs or people who like need to know that they are well regarded by the person they're interacting with in order to feel safe. I could talk about access needs all day. Is 
So as we wrap up today, um, I, you know, I really appreciate all of you um, being here and sharing and, you know, um, and, and, and building this community. Um, and because I think that part of shifting the community conversation on neurodiversity also um, requires people to have a community where they can show up as their true selves to do that work of unlearning and rewriting narratives together. And um, that's you're 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 helping us do that. So I um, thank you all so much for being here, and I hope you'll join us next week where we'll be talking about neurodivergent neurodivergent challenges in the workplace. See you then. Bye.